morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on this uh, holiday weekend, uh, raining Monday morning. We're so happy to have you all here. My name is Deborah James, and I'm the director of the International Program at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And we welcome you today to this uh, very exciting event on the scorecard on development, 1960 to 2016, 21st century progress in developing countries and the importance of China. We are also live streaming this event, and for those of you who are involved in Twitter, if you would like to make any tweeting comments about the event, we're also using the hashtag development and the hashtag scorecard on development. So we have a very uh, exciting panel here today. Uh, we're first going to have Mark Weisbrot uh, present the paper. Sieber is uh, just finishing our paper scorecard on development, which analyzes the latest trends in global development and their impact on poverty, economic progress throughout the world. It looks at data from 191 countries on economic growth and social indicators over the last 56 years and to see how countries have emerged from the long period of reduced economic and social progress that characterized the last two centuries, the last two decades of the 20th century and how many countries have rebounded in the 21st century. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, as they speak. Uh, first, we will be hearing from Mark Weisbrock, who is an author on the paper. Mark uh, has his PhD from the University of Michigan. He is a uh, prolific appearance uh, person in the media, uh, one of the most often cited uh, critics, I would say, of the international financial institutions. Uh, he has a regular column in the media that's distributed to over 550 newspapers across the country. And he is most recently the author of Failed, What Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. So here to present the paper, Mark Weisbaum. So, um, can I get a thing to move the, uh, there, let's move forward. Okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I know that's actually a holiday for a lot of people here in Washington. And so it's particularly encouraging that people actually came here uh, to hear something like this on a holiday. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Deborah, and thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Nancy, for being on the panel. And to everybody who helped organize this. Um, and I just, uh, I want to just to introduce this a little bit. Uh, we've been doing this paper since 2000, uh, kind of a update every five, six years, when we noticed there was a drastic slowdown in economic growth in, uh, you know, just growth of capita income, per capita GDP in the vast majority of low and middle income countries. And it didn't, it wasn't getting any, any attention. So this is a this is an update uh, in that sense, and there's you know um, always new things that are happening. So here, uh, just to show you why I think this is important, uh, this was a, this was President Obama's last speech at the United Nations, and he said you know over the last 25 years the number of people living in extreme poverty in the world fell from 40 percent to 10 percent. Now this is true according to World Bank statistics. And, and then he went on to explain that this was a result of globalization, the kind of globalization that the United States promotes specifically, or promoted and promoted over this period. And uh, that, uh, and this was an example of the great progress and that we should have to be careful not to let this slide. And, um, so this is true according to the World Bank statistics. There's some controversy over this, uh, but nonetheless, just accepting that. Um, the first thing is that uh, two thirds of this uh, poverty reduction was in, in China. Um, and if you go back a little further from 1981 to 2010, it's 94% of the net uh, poverty reduction in the world, uh, in extreme poverty was uh, in China. 
And then, if we look at just the 25 years that President Obama was talking about, and by the way, it isn't just him. There are a lot of people. Uh, the academics are more careful about conflating, you know, China with the, the world. But um, it, not that much. You see statements <laughs> like this all the time about the success of, of globalization and where people neglect to mention uh, that it's China. And um, so the other third of the, uh, so it was two thirds of, the, of this uh, poverty reduction was in China in the last 25 years. And the other third, it turns out uh, China had a lot to do with that as well. Um, and you can see, first of all, through trade in this graph. Um, so from 1990 to 2013, um, you have the share of exports from low and middle income countries uh, to China went from 0.8% um, of their exports to 9.7%. So China became a big market for their exports. And uh, another way to look at it is just the, and that's from 4 billion to 520 billion. You can also look at it as a percent of these countries, uh, the low and middle income country's GDP went from 0.1 to 2.6 percent. Now it fell off some from 2013 to 2016. 2013 was a peak. And I think that's had some impact, but still. Um, and you also had hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, uh, lending, and foreign aid. And these are not always that distinguishable because, you know, there's not uh, a lot of transparency in, in China's uh, foreign uh, dealings, but uh, it's nonetheless, it, it also had a big impact. And, and by the way, it also drove up commodity prices. And so when you see people refer to the uh, rebound, which we'll get to, of economic growth in the 21st century, it's often referred to in terms of the commodities boom. And that's kind of exaggerated. But one thing that the increase in commodity prices that was driven a lot by Chinese imports did was it helped a lot of countries avoid the balance of payments crises or constraints on their growth that they had uh, previously. So that was an important part of the influence of China in the, in the 21st century. So, okay, so Chinese uh, globalization has done very well, and it's, uh, you know, income per capita in China since 1980 uh, it multiplied 21 times. Uh, it's the fastest economic growth in world history by far. And, um, but it was based on very different uh, economic policies than the globalization that President Obama and um, a lot of the people who write for the media, and again, academics as well, are, are talking about. So just to look at a couple of them, first of all, you have most investment, until recently it was the majority of investment, uh, is con was controlled uh, by the government. And you have a huge role for uh, state-owned enterprises, as recently as 2010, uh, Forty-four percent of the assets um, of major industrial companies was the state-owned enterprises. It's still very large. We don't have uh, more recent exact data on it, but um, it's uh, it's a huge role. And um, you have the foreign investment that did come into the country, which certainly increased, was controlled so that it uh, didn't interfere, and in fact, augmented the state uh, development plan. That's a really big difference from the foreign investment that goes into, uh, for example, uh, most Latin American countries that went there uh, during this period. Uh, they also have requirements for uh, technology transfer, uh, performance requirements. These are things like requiring you know, local managers for example, and uh, a lot of export promotion. By the way, these are things that the World uh, Trade Organization was set up in 1995 to make it more difficult for 
uh, for developing countries to actually do this. But China didn't join until uh, 2000. And when they did, they still managed to continue doing uh, a lot of this. And that's a, an issue of contention, as you may have noticed recently, uh, with the Trump administration. Um, and of course, uh, the financial system has been state controlled. You don't have uh, an independent central bank, which was one of the major uh, neoliberal reforms of the period of globalization. Strict currency controls for, for most of the period. Um, and uh, more recently, they let up on some of those. And there's some debate on China in China over whether that was the right thing to do. They lost about a trillion dollars in reserves capital outflows, so it's not clear what the verdict on that is going to be. But in any case, oh and yeah, this is a big uh, thing if you want to compare it, uh, China's uh, policies to the other countries that were transitioning from a, a market to a, from a, I'm sorry, from a state a planned economy, really planned economy, to uh, a mixed economy. There was, was a very uh, gradual and planned transition, unlike, say, the, you know, Russia and the former uh, Soviet country. So that was very different. I'm just summarizing here some of the differences between the neoliberal globalization that was promoted from here in Washington and the international uh, institutions of global governance. You had a more indiscriminate opening in international trade and capital flows, central bank independence. Uh, was a major principle that was increased wherever uh, it could be done politically. And uh, you had the industrial development policies of the 1960 to 80 period were abandoned. Uh, tighter fiscal and monetary policies, uh, often pro cyclical and you had inflation targeting for the central banks. Uh, a lot of deregulation, especially financial, and increasing protectionism in the area of intellectual property, which was another founding principle of the World Trade Organization. So this is a very different kind of globalization than what China went through. And of course, the privatization of state-owned enterprises. So what we did uh, here is the latest version of just looking at, um, you can tell me when I'm running out of time. Um, uh, and you can read the paper for more detail on this, but basically, what we did was we looked at countries, we, uh, all the countries for which there's data, and we say, okay, we divide them into quintiles by uh, their per capita uh, GDP. It's in uh, 2011 uh, purchasing power parity dollars for purposes of comparison and domestic currency for the, uh, when we were talking about just the rate of growth. Um, and the, uh, and we say, okay, how fast did countries that were at say the level of $1,500 per capita, how fast did they grow uh, from 1960 to 80? They started out at that level. And how fast did they grow from 1980 to 2000? And then again, from 2000. Uh, so you're not looking at the same country comparison. You can do that too, and you do see a big slowdown. Like for Latin America, for example, if you just say, okay, you compare 60 to 80, with 80 and 2000, it's, a, it's all the difference in the world. It's like 91% uh, growth in cumulative growth in per capita income uh, from 1980 to 2000, and only 5.7%. Uh, I'm sorry, that's from 1960 to 1980, it was over 90%. And uh, from uh, 1980 to 2000, it's only 5.7%. So you had drastic change. And that, by the way, even though it's, it's almost never talked about, that was the major uh, impetus, in my opinion, to all the election of all the left governments that you had beginning in 1998. And, you know, Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and so on. And so, uh, but this is a comparison where we're not looking at the same countries in each period, we're looking at the, the countries that started out at a certain level. And if you think about it, um, they should do better, right? If you start out at a certain level in 1980, you should do better than if you started out in 1960 because there's more technology uh, and knowledge. And this should also help on the, on the health indicators as well. 
because you have you know advances in medicine and public health. So if anything, you're biasing it towards uh, a better result in the in the second period than the first. And the other thing this does is it controls for diminishing returns because you would expect and you do find that as countries get uh, to higher income levels, they don't grow as fast as when they're uh, developing. And also, it's harder to go from a life expectancy of uh, you know 70 to 80 than it is from 50 to 60. So what you can see here, if you look at the uh, bottom four uh, quintiles, you see a sharp slowdown from the 60 to 80 period to the last two decades of the 20th century. And then you see a big rebound in the 21st century. And uh, just to give you one example, if you look at the, uh, yeah, I guess I have it written on the next slide. Um, if you look at the second quintile, you can see that the difference is, is if, you, if it's cumulative, uh, for the 20 years, if you take the cumulative growth, it's a difference between growing 15% and uh, in, in the 80 to 2000 period and 60% before that. And so that uh, that's a very huge difference in the world and uh, it affects everything else as we'll see. And then you have, of course, this rebound in the 21st century where uh, growth comes back. So what we, you know, just to this, just very briefly to note some of the possible reasons uh, for the rebound, and we discussed this more in the in the last version of the paper. But uh, first, you had the loss of influence. The IMF lost most of its influence in middle-income countries in the world, and that was a major uh, force. It was the main avenue of influence of the United States on economic policy especially macroeconomic policy in developing countries prior to the 21st century. It still is, but the, most of the middle-income countries went away and didn't come back to the IMF after the uh, Asian uh, financial crisis of 1997-99. And so I think that this helped because uh, they had kind of a creditor's cartel as well with the World Bank and the other multilateral institutions, and that gave them power to enforce certain policies which uh, we would argue that uh, NET uh, had a, a negative influence. And whatever the cause, you can see that uh, counter-cyclical policies, for example, in the, in the world uh, financial crisis and recession of 2008-2009 were much more common than they were in previous uh, crises. So that was uh, positive. I think the IMF also changed some in some developing countries, not that much not as much as a lot of people think by their research, but the policy didn't change anywhere near as much as their research, but I think there was some impact there, as well as some positive impact in the, in the sense that uh, that they had less of a negative effect in the last downturn. But, they, but the main thing was the loss of their influence in many, many countries. Um, and of course, the high income countries did not contribute to this rebound at all. If you look at the aggregate growth in GDP of the high income countries, it actually fell from 3.1% uh, annually to 1.9, a big drop. So that was actually a negative influence on the rest of the world uh, in the shift to the 21st century. And I won't go into these uh, in detail, but you know, there's a, a strong uh, correlation between, um, if you look at cross-country comparisons, between health, in, in, health indicators and, and income growth. And this has been around for a long time. Angus Deaton wrote a book about it in 2011, and there's uh, some debate over why this is true, because it wouldn't have to be as true as it is. For example, there are a lot of uh, reductions in mortality that can be made for very little money, but historically you still see this very strong uh, correlation. And uh, so, and you see it here in the rate of change. Okay, so this is this graph shows again divided by quintile from the worst off at the bottom to the better off at the top. You see the rate of decline of mortality per thousand 
by births of under, uh, this is child mortality under age five. And you see again this, the same pattern for the bottom two quintiles. Uh, you see a, uh, a big reduction in the rate of progress and then a rebound in the 21st century. And you see a, a similar pattern in female and male adult mortality. Now, in quintile two, you see actually progress goes to a reversal. You see an increase in mortality in the second quintile in both uh, female and then uh, male uh, mortality. Now, this was primarily the AIDS uh, crisis. Uh, and if you take out the 16 countries, which were all in sub-Saharan Africa, that had an increase in mortality of more than uh, three per thousand uh, during this period, then you get the, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see for female mortality, it goes back to the same uh, pattern of the other indicators. You get a big decline in progress, but not an absolute uh, increase in mortality. So again, this is part of the result of this uh, slowdown in progress. Uh, infant mortality, again, for the bottom, actually three quintiles, you see this uh, pattern as well. Um, so, conclusion. Uh, first of all, many who praise the globalization for the last 25 years or more uh, are really praising Chinese economic policy without <laughs> recognizing it, and the public doesn't recognize it. Um, so that's kind of important. Not to say that Chinese, uh, the Chinese model is going to be you know, directly applicable because they were transitioning from a completely state-planned economy to a, uh, to a mixed economy. But nonetheless, there's probably a lot that can be learned about development policy uh, from their most uh, you know, economically successful uh, policy in history. Um, and I think there should also be a lot more uh, skepticism and inquiry uh, regarding this globalization, the neoliberal globalization, I would call it, and the policies that were implemented in the low and middle income countries, uh, and um, including, uh, and there is that skepticism now, by the way, regard to globalization in the high income countries. Now again, I'm not promoting uh, something like Brexit, uh, but uh, that skepticism is now recognized uh, in the economics profession as well. You do see a big change from 20 years ago where there is a recognition that, you know, uh, the standard economic theories, there are winners and losers from opening the trade, for example, and now the economics profession is recognizing that in the high income countries, maybe the losers weren't uh, compensated enough, so-called losers. And, uh, you don't see so much of a change, though, when you look at development policy in the um, in developing countries during the, you know, the globalization process that took place. This should be uh, looked at more. And also the institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, which made the rules uh, and still tries to enforce them. These should be looked at more skeptically, I think, because you had this long-term uh, failure. Uh, both of these things, the failure and the rebound, I think should be a topic for uh, of interest. And here, I didn't put this here, but I think it's really, really important, especially uh, in the way that the debate has shifted, the role of economic policy. I know it's difficult to investigate. There are a lot of things going on. And by the way, you know, the, the results that we have are robust to the period that you picked. So, when we compare 1960 to 80 to 82,000, you could change those dates to get the same results. If we had data for the 50s and included that, the result would be even stronger, okay? And so uh, the, you know, the 70s, for example, was a very bad decade. You had two uh, big oil shocks that led to global recessions and uh, very high inflation. So you can make this comparison. Obviously, it doesn't prove that there's a causal uh, connection between the 
this long-term economic failure and the policies that were implemented during this period, but it should be a, a basis for this skepticism. But the last point I want to make is the importance of economic policy, because you have a lot, of, uh, you have really influential books like, uh, you know, Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, for example, had a very powerful influence, I think. And there's very little in there on the role of economic policy. It's all about institutions. Uh, and institutions are what drive the differences between successful and unsuccessful economic uh, policy. What about the policy itself? That's really been buried. The, the, I mentioned in the paper, the Richard Baldwin's book, that's another book that's all about, uh, that, that one's actually about, um, you know, the, the driving force is, uh, what is changes in information communications technology. Again, it's not economic policy. So I think that should also be a very big topic of interest for economists. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.